Hello everybody, it's Phil from One Wall Studio again, just checking in to show you guys a new video that I've had on the docket for an extremely long time. This video is about how to make undynamic drums more dynamic. So I know we've all been there at some point in our lives. We've gotten a set of stems that have been kind of horrific to deal with that some might say have problems. We're very clearly MIDI that just had like infinite 127 across the board. So like zero dynamic range, everything was 100% the whole time. So here's an example of that real quick. So needless to say, it's very clear that a bunch of those were supposed to be ghost notes. And because they were 127 velocity the whole way across, they ended up just becoming these massive smacks all over the place. So every single one of these is the exact same sample, machine gunning and triggered over and over again. The kick is like... Yeah. In fact, let's see what happens if I were to just really quick duplicate the track and do that and then... Say, move this to here. If I push this off sync. Okay, so for the most part, it seems like the exact same sample triggered over and over again. Just needed to make sure. So, what do you do when you have a situation like this? There's a number of different techniques that you could utilize. So, the first technique I'm going to utilize is sample replacement. Now, how are you going to get samples to be more dynamic? Well, first of all, you should use something that has a round robin or a multi-sample uh, loader, like Steven Slate Trigger. You should go through, you should find, see, audition, whatever kind of sample you really want. I like that one. And that one. So now it should be like that. Now, what's the main issue here is that it's still going to be the same velocity, generally. It's still not super dynamic, and you really can't make it more dynamic just in Slate Trigger itself, unless you were to do a couple of things. So the classic trick is to do a low cut and a high cut so that it's getting less of that information in there. But then your issue is the samples that are playing are all still the same velocity. They're just lower velocity, which isn't really what we want. What we want is dynamics, right? So either you could automate that low cut function, which would take forever, or you could automate the process to some extent by doing this. So th throwing a compressor in behind trigger is going to allow you to do this. Now you notice that if you adjust the release to be a lot slower, then the natural thing that happens when a person's playing drums is going to occur. See, when you're playing drums, your foot isn't the same consistent velocity the whole time, unless you're an extremely well-trained drummer, and even then there's going to be some variation. So by throwing a compressor on before it, you're turning down the volume as it comes in and plays more rapidly successive notes. So throwing a compressor in beforehand will adjust the velocity to varying degrees as you're replacing it with another sample, thereby creating a far more dynamic sample. So now you have a much more dynamically played sample that sounds more realistic because initial hits are heavier and then respective hits are a little bit less loud depending on how far apart they are. So this creates a feeling of dynamics that's a lot more realistic. So if you notice, if I were to render that, you would then have a kick track that is a lot more dynamic across the board. You could then presumably even mute or unmute it and blend it in as a one shot. So that way you keep the initial sample that they liked blended in with a more dynamic one. And then boom, you've got a much more powerful performance overall that's going to still evoke more human emotions, but has that blended in one shot snappiness.
so you feel how that changes things a lot. And honestly, in my opinion, it changes it for the better. And so long as the phase is aligned, you can blend in the original sample, no big deal. But now it goes from this uncomfortably consistent Like, there's no life in that. There's no variation. You blend that in a little bit with a new one. Boom. That's the quick and easy way to do it. However, there's going to be situations where you really want a lot more control over it. And honestly, sometimes the best thing you can do is create an automation schema or clip gain things so that they're not as loud so when you do replace the sample with a trigger all right there we go that's really realistic drop that bottom make it feel a little bit more noticeable all right so now as we go along you'll notice the problem is still much the same so one thing that i would highly recommend is in instituting a little bit of a low cut on it then adjusting to taste with clip gain some of the hits in between and still doing that traditional compressor trick but maybe a little bit less attack so that it takes time to build So for a blast, that would make it a lot more natural sounding. And for this section, you get a little bit more of that ghost note feel because you clip gained it down. So you get more like a... You could even then adjust this so that it's a little bit less aggressive than the one before it. So you create a dynamics envelope using clip gain. Now, that may take some time, but in the end, it'll be well worth it, because then you'll have the ghost notes to mess with. And I'll give this a little bit less volume here. So I'm going to go through this and do the whole thing, and then you can see how much more effective it'll sound. So now it feels a lot more realistic in terms of velocity. So what I can do is I can render that, use that as the primary snare stem, and then I can go about this, creating a duplicate track of this, just for the sake of fun. I can go boom. I can go snare original. And I can use this as a one-shot to blend in with the rest of it. Again, always check phase when you're dealing with stuff like this, because it may be that the one-shot is effectively cancelling out the phase of the other. Phase might change a lot more on the sampled track versus the one-shot. So with that one, it was a combination of compression and clip gain. With Tom tracks, dynamics might not be an issue. You may be able to get away with doing a little bit less work. So with Tom's... What you can do is usually just replace it with another sample and it'll be dynamic enough. Let's say you wanted to replace your floor tom with a big, fat, punchy floor tom. Well, here's some interesting stuff that you can do. You can actually automate this volume knob right here with some creative automation. So the input volume on trigger two should allow you to increase the volume that trigger detects gradually. Now you want to keep in mind that depending on your automation lanes in your DAW, that might change the efficacy. So you might overdo it, you might underdo it, but it's generally a good idea to make sure that it still hits those and find out what range the hits are between velocity-wise for the input to work most effectively. 
And you can create little ramps like that and make the drum part a lot more interesting. You can also ramp it down. Thereby creating a much more dynamic track. Because your track is more dynamic with that input, it's basically like clip gaining, but it's a lot easier to ramp things up or ramp things down. So you could use that technique any day, and you might not even have to use a compressor with it, depending on how effective the gate. There's a whole bunch of factors, but that's why this is another good technique to know how to use, especially for something like Steven Slate Trigger or Drumagog. You can also automate the input gain on that. So most drum replacers or drum sample replacement techniques will let you use this. The other benefit to that is that once you are to render the track, you then have a purely intact version of the original because you can get rid of the automation by getting rid of the trigger plugin, and then you can blend in the original as a one-shot if you so desire very easily. That creates a little bit more dynamics, which is a lot of fun. So now that we have much more dynamic versions of everything here, we still have to worry about the hi-hat, the ride, and the crash. Now the problem with a lot of these things is that you're not going to get very many packs of trigger or drumagog replacement symbols, a lot of the time you'll find that it is much easier to do something like this. So load up your favorite drum sampler. In my case, I chose uh, Steven Slate, and I'm going to add a hi-hat, a ride. I like that one. A crash. Then... I'm going to use a built-in MIDI triggering software. Now, a lot of people will use something like a gate to send a MIDI trigger. I know a lot of DAWs come with them by default. So one way you can do that is with, in Reaper, you can use Regate. And you can send a MIDI open note or a close note. And then you would send that to your drum sampler. Sending specifically the MIDI. You don't need to send any audio. And then once you've sent the hi-hat track with that gate on it you can adjust the note i'd prefer the shank open so i'll make that 65 And that was with the gate. Another option that you have is sending with some kind of drum triggering software that makes a MIDI signal, JS Audio to Drum MIDI Trigger. And this works the exact same way, but with a few more parameters. So this is going to be very interesting with what you're capable of. Let me get rid of the audio, send just the MIDI, free fader, and adjust that MIDI note. So if I'm going for a ride, then I presumably want to get the bell which would be 53. So I'll adjust the MIDI note to 53. And then... I adjust the parameters to make it easier to detect. And then what I have the ability to do is actually use a velocity humanizing plugin just to make sure that it gets some good variation in the MIDI that's being sent. 
You'll notice that this changes the rate. Now you might want it to be a little less aggressive, you might not. And you can also set a baseline velocity for it. Thereby creating a much more effective drum MIDI trigger. Another thing that can really help you though is audio to MIDI for crashing. What you'll notice is it may be easiest to create, depending on the sample, a low pass and high pass filter that specifically addresses the band where the crash is less likely to wash. That way it gets the impact without triggering the MIDI too much without all the sizzle in the high end getting in the way, so that the level of the input drops significantly. Now, I want the crash 57. What you might notice is you have to adjust the volume level significantly for it to actually trigger. And that's okay. And once again, I'm going to get rid of the audio, make sure that it's pre-fader so that I can turn down the track itself. With the same MIDI velocity thing, I can adjust the baseline velocity and humanize. Well, something about this is creating a massive re-triggering. So even though I adjusted the high pass and the low pass, I'm going to have to adjust open threshold based off of the input. So it's showing 9 as my input threshold. So I shouldn't open it until it hits 9. And I should close it the moment it hits something closer to 11 or 13. And just to be sure, I'll increase the re-trigger interval as well. That way it only hits once when it's supposed to hit once. The big struggle is going to be finding these longer hits and making sure that they hit at the right timing. There you go. Now by creating that filtered peak, you're creating a situation where the high end sizzle doesn't necessarily take over the entire drum trigger threshold. Some drum trigger programs will actually mute the original signal when you put them on the track, just like this one does, and then you can blend in the original. So if I wanted to, I could hear that original, but I don't want to. I just want to hear the replaced triggered versions. And then with the MIDI baseline velocity, I can adjust that, increase the humanization a little more, creating a lot more dynamicism in the track. And now I have this overhead track here from the drum sampler, creating a situation where I can treat it as overheads. Raise that in the overhead. But also kind of a room track for these. So let's unmute all of these. The fun thing about the hi-hat is that even though the velocity is not nearly good enough, I can still use the MIDI velocity adjuster on that track after the gate. So there you have it. Now you have a ridiculously dynamic and much more natural sounding drum kit. And you can actually control the individual levels so much more effectively. We've reintroduced ghost notes and dynamics and flow by changing the velocities in numerous ways, all from an original 
WAV file that had no dynamics whatsoever. Everything was the exact same velocity. Everything felt very stiff and sterile. And if you were to listen to how it sounded originally, the difference is night and day. So let's open up the original session. Golly. Let me undo that. Here we go. So that just sounds bad overall. No dynamics. The snare very clearly wasn't written that way or intended to be that way. However, if you adjust it now, now we have a far more dynamic, far more acceptable, and much more easy to mix track. And that is just so much more pleasing to listen to by default because it's so much more realistic and it carries with it a little bit more, even though it was manipulated after the fact, it carries with it more emotion and dynamics of presentation and performance. So those are just a couple of ways that you can take an extremely undynamic 127 velocity across the board drum performance and find subtle ways to make them better. Now, a lot of them require replacing the original samples with more dynamic samples, because once they're that loud and once they're that undynamic, the damage has been done. This is literally a matter of repairing a performance, and it does require some tools that are specialized to that particular purpose. So everybody has a comp in their doll. Not everybody has a drum replacer. Not everybody has uh, trigger programs. But most people have a gate and a comp. And from there, you can find ways to trigger new samples in a much more efficacious way through MIDI and through direct translation of audio to MIDI, as well as sending a MIDI open signal with a MIDI velocity adjuster on the track. So if there's any other ways that you guys want to hear about or that you would like to recommend, please leave them in the comments below. I'm happy to help you guys out whenever, because this was actually a requested video. And I hope that that does some degree of good in helping you guys get more dynamic drum mixes and more effective performances in your mixes, even if the ones that you were sent are a little bit off kilter. It may seem like a lot of work, but to be honest, I was using every technique I could think of, and it still took me less than a half hour to edit this one minute of track. So if you're doing drum editing anyway, uh, it might help you to do some clip gaining along the way and blending in samples to make sure that the dynamics of the performance can be fully appreciated based on the song, especially with stuff like ghost notes. Ghost notes really sound terrible if they're not ghost notes. That's all for today. Thank you very much. If you guys have any other recommendations or requests, I love to hear comments from you guys in the comment section below. My name is Phil from One Wall Studio, and I'm out. See you guys next time.